So we're going to start out today uh, continuing with our discussion about cardinals and their enumeration as a proper subclass of the ordinals. And we're going to also look at uh, Cantor's continuum problem with which he wrestled for the final decades of his life. So the idea was of the cardinals was that there would be omega, which is the first, well, the only infinite countable cardinal. And then after omega comes omega one, the first uncountable cardinal. This is the least ordinal that can't be bijected with omega. And then after omega one becomes omega two, the least ordinal where there is no bijection between it and omega one and so on. And we saw that for any cardinal, there's always a larger cardinal. If I take a set of cardinals, I could take their supremum as a set of ordinals, and that would also be a larger cardinal. So the cardinals are interspersed throughout the ordinals, going all the way up through the ordinals and forming a proper class there. Cantor's problem, which was, he didn't know where on this scale of cardinals to put the cardinality of the real line, or if you like, the power set of the natural numbers. Was it at omega one, the very first uncountable cardinal, or was it somewhere further up? This was the question that he, that he wrestled with. And we now know that we can't either prove this answer one way or the other. We can't prove that the cardinality of the real numbers has cardinality omega one. But we can also prove that we can't disprove it either. So the axioms of said theory, when we try and make these proofs, are just inadequate to decide this question. So what a lot of current day said theorists do is they think up um, axioms to extend the system with, or properties of the V hierarchy of sets, which might answer this question. But to date, this has all been to no avail. So looking at the cardinal line, I'll draw the cardinal line here horizontally for a change. Okay. Here's zero, here are the finites up at the top, very small. We shan't be paying much attention to them. Here is omega, right? The ordinal is a set of finites. And we call this omega zero, or it's also called aleph zero. Then come more ordinals, which are not cardinals, omega plus one, omega plus two, omega plus omega. And then comes the next cardinal. So this is the first uncountable cardinal. Uncountable cardinal. Then come more ordinals, but then there's omega two omega n, supremum of these, we call as omega sub omega. And then there's always a larger cardinal, so this will be omega sub omega plus one. Right? So in the enumeration of cardinals, omega alpha, we thought of as f, we had this aleph function, where f Aleph takes the ordinals into the cardinals. Okay. And if we had a successor ordinal, this would take us into a successor cardinal. It's the next cardinal beyond Aleph alpha. Okay. Or sometimes we just write this as and if alpha plus here, no brackets in. Right? So this is a, a typical successor cardinal. If I have a limit ordinal, if lambda here is a limit ordinal, this is defined to be the supremum of the previous cardinals.
So this was the state of affairs at the end of last, last lecture. So Cantor's problem was, so sorry, I should say continuum problem. Continuum, WM. It concerned the real continuum. So a slightly old fashioned term for the, the reals here was the real continuum. So R we've seen is bijective with thinking about its binary expansions there with two to the omega. So this is the cardinality of the set of functions from omega into two. Yeah. Thinking of these as characteristic functions of subsets of omega, this is the same as the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers. So the question is, is two to the omega, which is the size of R here, is this equal to omega one? So we look at the size of R and we want to know, we look at the cardinality of R, we want to know where on the number line to put it. Yeah, we know by Cantor's theorem that the power set of omega is uncountable. And we saw this direct diagonal proof that the reals were uncountable. So the cardinality bar is not omega, it's not finite. So it's one of these guys over here. So Cantor believed that actually the answer to the question is yes, that the cardinality of R is omega one. So another way of putting this is often you know, two to the omega zero is omega one, or two to the aleph zero. You'll see this in textbooks as well, is aleph one. So this will be saying, so just kind of tease this out a little bit more. This will be saying, if this were so, There'll be no set X, right? Which contains the natural numbers contained in the reals here, which is of intermediate cardinality between this and this. Right? I mean, here cardinality of N then would be less than or equal to cardinality of X, it's less than or equal to the cardinality of the reals. This is just the set of natural numbers. So this is just omega or omega zero. And this is, well, this, two to the omega zero. So if this were omega one here, there'd be no cardinals in between here and here, any set here, it would either have to equal omega zero or it would have to equal omega one. So any such set X, either it's bijective with the natural numbers because it's countable or it's bijective with the whole class of reals. It couldn't be anything in between. Here. It's contains the naturals. 
and it's a collection of reals. So either it's projected with this or it's projected with this. It couldn't be some intermediate size. Since there's no intermediate, cardinality for x strictly between omega zero and omega one. So this is all supposing that this continuum problem had this affirmative answer. Now, the size of the set of reals was the very next cardinal it could be. But if on the other hand, this was omega 17, right, then there'd be possibilities for the cardinality of x of omega 1, omega 2, or anything up to omega 16, and it would still be intermediate of intermediate size. So this could be of intermediate cardinality. If its size was one of the intermediate things here, where one less than equal to i is less than 17. So there'll be all sorts of possibilities. So I formalize this uh, as a definition, right here. Yeah. Definition 438. So this is the continuum hypothesis. Right, and this is often abbreviated CH. The two to the omega, omega zero is omega one. Right? Two to the aleph zero is aleph one. If we use the aleph notation here. The generalized continuum hypothesis is says that this kind of picture occurs for all of the alephs. So now this is GCH. That says for all alpha, two to the aleph alpha is the very next cardinal it could be. By Cantor's theorem, this is the size of the power set of aleph alpha. It's bigger than the size of aleph alpha. So aleph alpha is less than two to the aleph alpha. Again. By Cantor's theorem on power sets. So, just to recall that. So, I mean, we know it's bigger than this. Is it the very next cardinal it could be, or is it something larger? So, Hilbert at the 1900 International Congress of Mathematicians. Hilbert was uh, kind of the great German uh, mathematician, or great, um, the great mathematician of Europe in the first half, last half of the 19th and first half of the 20th century. So he was invited to give a list of problems. Well, he was invited to give a lecture, and he chose to give a list of problems which he thought were significant problems for the 20th century mathematics to solve. And this continuum problem as to whether CH was true or false, he placed as number one on the list here. 
as I said, it still remains uh, open. We're in this kind of twilight world of not knowing this answer. A girdle, right, great 20th century logician, showed that in said theory, the axioms that we've been discussing This is ZFC abbreviates our axioms that we've been talking about. In ZFC, in ZFC said theory, okay, we cannot prove not CH. So we can't prove that 2 to the LF 0 is bigger than LF1. Two to the LF zero is bigger than LF one. It's impossible. The axioms are not strong enough to, to prove this statement or cannot prove this statement. And then in uh, 63, Paul Cohen proved the following, for which he got a, a Fields Medal. Instead of C said theory, we can't prove it the other way. So these are proofs, right? So Gödel showed, Gödel proved that in ZFC said theory, we cannot prove two to the LF zero is bigger than LF one. So Cohen showed, gave a proof that in ZFC said theory, we cannot prove that two to the LF zero equals LF one. So what we have then is these axioms are not good enough to settle this question. So the upshot is we say cannot decide CH. From logical notation, if you're doing a logic course next, next semester, we write something like this. ZFC, we can't prove not CH. This is Gödel. And Cohen showed we can't prove CH. You don't need to remember these, these symbols here. So this means then that this cardinal exponentiation function is problematic for ZFC said theory, right? There's all sorts of questions we can't answer right? because this theory can't decide CH. So what uh, modern set theorists do is they try and enhance this system of axioms here to try and find something that will decide the continuum problem. I mean, some people have kind of come to a kind of philosophy of despair, right? And they just say, because we can't prove it either way, and we have these two theorems that we can't prove it either way from these very intuitive set of axioms that we have for sets, you know, perhaps the CH doesn't, isn't meaningful for mathematics. Right? But I would strongly dispute that. I mean, the CH is precisely this question that I've said here, stated here. I mean, this is an entirely mathematically meaningful question, right? To say, if I take a, a set of reals that contains the natural numbers, is it either bijective with the naturals or the reals? Right? This is a question that any mathematician understands. And I think it's 
an entirely meaningful question. So the um, continuum problem is simply just uh, an open problem in set theory. Um, Fermat's last theorem was open for 300 years and this continuum problem has only been discussed for about 100 years. Right? Um, so there is time yet, we hope. Fine. So what I'll do now is um, look at some of the exercises related to cardinal arithmetic and do some examples here. So first I'll do some things that are similar to exercises 437 and 438, which I set this week. So, and this is kind of a favorite kind of question, things like this. Simplify the following. Um, first, without assuming GCH. And then again, assuming it. You see that we'll see what this means when it comes along. So here's the GCH again, right? generalized continuum hypothesis. Two to the omega sub alpha is omega sub alpha plus one. Every power set is its has the next possible least size it could have. So. Okay, so here's one. Two to the aleph zero to the power two to the aleph zero. So we, this is about rules of cardinal exponentiation. So two to the aleph zero, we saw that that is this. Two to the kappa to the lambda is two to the kappa times lambda. That's what I'm using there. Now I'm going to use the fact that by Cantor, this is strictly bigger than this. And the cardinality of a product is the larger of the two. So I'm using that aleph zero is less than two to the aleph zero here. And cardinality of kappa times lambda is the same as kappa plus lambda is the maximum of the two. This is a corollary to Hessenberg's theorem. Okay, so we've actually gone as far as we can without assuming the GCH. If we assume the GCH, then this is LF1. Okay. But the GCH again applied a second time says that this is LF2. So GCH gives us this nice further simplification here. Okay, let's see some more examples like this. Okay, and a five to the power three cubed. Well, 
This is just LF5 times LF5 times LF5. And again, this is just the maximum of any of these. It's just LF5. And GCH or not is not relevant here. Right? So uh, this will also mean LF5 cubed plus LF3 to the 17. Well, we've already seen what this is. This is just LF5. And this is just LF3 multiplied together 17 times. So by the rules as before, it's just the maximum of those. Of course, it's just LF3. So this is just plus LF3 here. And the larger of the two. So it comes to LF5 again. And if I'd written times in here, it would have been the same answer. Okay, what about LF5 to the power LF5? Uh, just recall, by lemma 431, actually this is the same as the size of 2 to the other 5, right? Or indeed, this equals kappa to the other 5. For any kappa that's greater than or equal to two and less than or equal to LF5. For any cardinal. So this equals, for example, LF3 to the LF5. Two to the LF5, LF3 to the LF5, 17 to the LF5. These are all the same. So we have two to the LF five here. Which is pretty simple and there's nothing else you can do without the GCH. If we assume the GCH this implies this equals, well, the very next cardinal, LF6. And this one I've oh, partly already answered, LF3 to the LF5. Again, by the same lemma, this is the same as 2 to the LF5. If I look here at this, 2 to the LF0, and I add LF omega here. Actually, there's nothing I can say, right? But you might say, wait a moment, this is surely bigger than this, but we don't know that without GCH. It could be that the size of the real line is bigger than alpha omega. So we don't know which of these is larger. Unless we have GCH. 
GCH will say this is LF1. Plus LF omega. And now the larger of these two is LF omega. Minus maximum there. So one can multiply examples like this, I dare say, ad infinitum. Here's Aleph Omega. I've raised it to the power Aleph Omega sub one. So again, warning here, this is the Omega first cardinal, right? So there are uncountably many cardinals less than Aleph Omega one. So this is the first cardinal with uncountably many cardinals smaller than it. Well, this is certainly a cardinal smaller than that. So actually this just equals here two. To the Aleph Omega one here. So again, this is lemma, I keep quoting lemma 431. Okay. Because this is my kappa. It's greater than or equal to two, and it's less than the exponent here. So that's this. Again, nothing else to say, um, so, but if you have the GCH, then this implies that this is the very next cardinal. So this equals, so I use this plus notation, the very next cardinal after two to the Aleph Omega. So this is Aleph Omega one, and then plus one, one more there, here. So we use the GCH in going from here to here. Okay, so do think about these and get used to this notation and again, this could all be written out using omegas. Right. Down here. So this is, as I keep saying, is the alternative notation. Okay, so eight. Aleph omega squared. And Aleph omega squared. Which is larger. Okay. I only put this in to illustrated as a pitfall here. What this is here is this is the omega squared aleph, right? Also omega sub omega squared gets a little bit difficult to write <coughs> here. So it's a little way along the Aleph line, right? Um, it's beyond all the omega times K Alephs, right? It's the supremum of those. So. The Aleph alpha is for alpha less than omega squared. Okay. So I could also, could write that as this. Here is the 
omega times k right here for k less than omega. So it's a little big, but not so big. But what about this one here? What we had here was ordinal exponentiation, right? The function here takes ordinals to cardinals. But actually here, what is intended is card, sorry. Here, what we have is ordinal exponentiation, right? is the omega squared Aleph. Here, we've got cardinal exponentiation. So there's a little bit of danger of confusion between this, this two kinds of exponentiation are being used here in the same, same sentence. Right? For the subscripts to the Alephs or to the omegas, this is always ordinal arithmetic that's down here, right? if it involves squares or cubes or powers. Right? I mean, usually if you're given any question, it'll be made clear to you what kind of exponentiation is going on. You see, for plus and times, we've got these separate symbols for cardinal and ordinal operation. Right? But there, there kind of isn't anything for exponentiation. There's no kind of letter or symbolic thing. We, we indicate exponentiation just by raising something off the line of the page in both cases. So we have to distinguish. But you'll, you'll be told here. Yeah if there's anything um, doubtful, perhaps, in an exam. So what is the answer here? Right? This is Aleph Omega Cardinal Aleph Omega times Aleph Omega, and this is just Aleph Omega. Right? No need for GCH, it just is what it is. So this is less than alpha omega squared. So this one was the larger down here. So there's lots of possible questions that you can ask here. Uh, Let's look at exercise um, four. I can't find it at the moment. Um, 432. Are there cardinals alpha such so that alpha is Aleph sub alpha? Okay, so what this would mean in the enumeration of cardinals is that this gadget here, right, it's so large that it has that many cardinals below it. It's the first, if I look at a fixed, I think of this as like a fixed point of the enumeration of the uh, Alice. Of this AF Aleph function, right? Because F Aleph of alpha is supposed to be omega sub alpha. So if it's a fixed point, it returns itself. Yeah. Can this happen, right? It would seem to be some enormously large cardinal number. It's so large that it has as many cardinals below it as it is. Right? But in fact, there are such cardinals. Okay. 
So we find the least one. So we'll start out with defining a sequence. A sequence of cardinals. For alpha n, n less than omega. Um, we set alpha tilde to be the supremum of the alpha n's. This will be our fixed point, we hope. So we'll set alpha zero to be just omega zero. Right? Alpha one will be, I'll call this F. I won't keep writing the L F all the time. F of alpha zero. Okay, so this is omega sub alpha zero. Okay. okay, and this is omega sub omega zero. So this cardinal is the first one with infinitely many cardinals below it. Infinitely many infinite cardinals below it. I keep forgetting the finites, right? Alpha two, sorry, uh, alpha two, it's going to be f of alpha one. So this is going to be omega of f of alpha zero. So this is omega of this thing. So in the enumeration of the Alephs, Alpha two is the omega sub omega one here. And this will go on. So this, these will grow really fast. Right? So this is going to look like something like this. These are all subscripts, yeah, not exponential powers. And I think there should then be here, um, all together from here down to here, there should be something like n plus one omegas. Yeah, and then the bottom, Aleph zero, omega zero. So then we're going to say that, well, I told you, Alpha tilde will be the supremum of these alpha n's. So these are growing really fast up through the cardinals here. So we claim then this is a fixed point. Okay, so then this will be the thing we're after. So What are we going to do here? So what I've got then here is that alpha tilde, right? We defined it to be the soup of the alpha ends. So of course it's also the soup of the alpha n plus ones. Because this is alpha n plus one. And the supremum of these this is then going to be omega of the supremum of these indices, alpha tilde here. So that's a little bit quick. We can say something a little bit more precise. Okay. 
gamma is less than alpha tilde here, then where is it? What we have is alpha n is less than or equal to some gamma is less than alpha n plus one. If it's less than alpha tilde, it's less than one of the other, one of the alphas here. So it falls in between one and the next one here. But now I apply the function f, which is an increasing function enumerating more and more cardinals. Here. Well, this is what we were calling um, f of this is this. f of beta is omega sub beta. Down here. So what have I shown? I've taken a gamma less than alpha tilde. And I've shown that f of gamma here is less than this, so it's less than alpha tilde. So f of alpha tilde, which is going to be the supremum of all of the previous cardinals enumerated by f, will just be this alpha tilde itself. And so what, what have we got? We've got essentially that F on alpha tilde is all contained in alpha tilde. Anything less than alpha tilde gets sent by F to something less than alpha tilde here. It's going to be the supremum here of these F of alphas for alpha less than alpha tilde here. And this is just F of alpha tilde. Right. So recall, if lambda was a limit, F of lambda is the supremum of the F of tors for tor less than lambda. So that's what I'm using here. F of alpha tilde is the supremum of these smaller things here. Right? So alpha tilde is F of alpha tilde. So the job is done. We found this fixed point here. So remarkably enough, there are fixed points in the enumeration of the, the LF function. So the last kind of oddity I just want to point out before we finish here is we don't know that kappa is less than lambda implies that two to the kappa is less than two to the lambda. Nothing we've said so far does that, unless we have the GCH. Then yes, two to the kappa is the next cardinal after kappa, right? Which is less than or equal to lambda, and that is less than lambda plus, which is two to the lambda. So in that case, the answer is yes. GCH says that's the case. But without the GCH, we might have, for example, two to the L of zero is the same thing as two to the L of one. So it might be that the size of the power set of the naturals 
is exactly the same as the size of the power set here of, of Aleph 1. Seems a little bit counterintuitive, right? You'd think as you increase through the cardinals, the sizes of the power sets might increase right here. But we don't necessarily know that's the case, right? That can't be ruled out. And in fact, the kind of proofs that Cohen gave in 1963 show that it's consistent, right? That you can have things like this happening. So again, this just illustrates how much we don't know. 